Hi, I'm Carl Ehlers. I've been a professional graphic designer for 37 years. And about the last 19 years, I've been the art director at Wood Magazine. I am not a professional photographer, but I very much enjoy photography. And nothing makes me sadder than to see images come in from readers to potentially go in the magazine that they've spent a lot of time, a lot of man hours and, and money on, a lot of extra effort to build beautiful heirloom projects only to have a very simple photograph come out not the way that they wanted. There's some main areas, examples that we see for projects that come in overall that we kind of look for, we see problems with. Harsh light is one of them, uh, especially for outdoor projects. Uh, ideally, you want to have uh, kind of an overcast day, not where it's stormy, but if you can get a nice gray kind of overcast day, it's a lot easier to light something than if the sun is way too intense and blowing that out, making harsh shadows. So here are some examples of what I'm referring to. Avoid shooting outside, like I said, with harsh sunlight and deep shadows. Overcast days are better and avoid clutter in the background. In this particular one, the project is pretty well lit. It's a little bit too harsh, but there's some buckets in the background that within five seconds could have been pulled away for the composition of the photo. A beautiful outdoor scene, just vivid color, but again, way too much harsh light coming in from the one side. And if they would have adjusted the angle of the camera up just a little bit higher, it would have made for a much nicer composition. Very simple things to do. A nice garden gate, but again, too harsh of light, which caused some very dark shadows, which actually hide some of the insets and the detail in the gate. One that could have been by just controlling the shadows and maybe not cropping it so tight could have been a much nicer shot. I love the composition on this one, father and son with matching workbenches that they built together. The problem is, is that this direct sunlight overhead is virtually washing the benches out. And it's also making a very harsh contrast on both of their faces. So a beautiful composition, just staged perfectly with the angles of the projects, is just kind of lessened by the, the harsh lighting conditions. Cropping is another factor. I've seen so many times where beautiful projects, for one reason or another, have one of the corners cropped off. Here this gentleman built this beautiful oversized Adirondack chair and about a third of the chair on the bottom is cropped out. Here's a music stand with a lot of detail. It's got insets in it, but the focus is not very good. And actually two sides, the, uh, the one side of the project and the bottom of the project are cropped off again, could have been easily solved. Here's a beautiful display cabinet that obviously took a lot of man hours to build. And again, as simple as it sounds, the bottom of the project is cropped off. Another area beyond lighting and cropping is clearing the clutter out around a project. Now, sometimes you might not be able to shoot this on a sweep or on like a, a garage floor uh, where it's got a clean background around it. But especially if you have it in a setting in your home and you want a nice photo of it, take a little bit of extra time to kind of clean things up around it. Uh, this particular project, there's a dead plant in the background, some shoes and some other things on a bench that taking just five extra minutes to review the photo and take those things out would have made for a much better shot. This particular one is a very nice rustic bench. The problem is, is that the shape of the bench and the shape of the bed footboard are too close together. So you can't tell where one project starts and the other one stops. They both meld together. And I'm sure that wasn't the intention. Here's a beautiful, large rocking motorcycle, which they decided to put on a card table that they use for painting on top of a piece of plywood. It could have been much nicer. They've got great lighting, they've got a great angle, but there's so much clutter in it that it takes away from the overall project. Here's a beautiful cabinet with mirrors on the front, but they didn't take the extra time to shoo their cat out of the photo. So not only do you see the cat in the foreground, 
you see it in the reflection of the mirror as well. So your eye tends to be distracted from the project and onto those little things that are in the way. Again, we all love our pets, but here is one where they took the time to put a rug down in their shop, but their beautiful German Shepherd is laying right under the desk. And that's really what your eye is going to, not the beauty of the desk, but all the other things that are going on around it. Here's a, a beautiful cross that had some intricate carving that was done as part of the cross, but the amount of clutter and detail that's in the glass cabinet behind it distracts from the clean shape of the cross itself. A beautiful coffee table, but the pattern of the table and the pattern of the rug are so similar that you're not able to break the parts of this beautiful raised top table away from the carpet below it. The colors are the same, the beautiful grain of the table and the figure is lost because of the color of the carpet. And here is a Maloof inspired rocker that they put out in their garage and took the time to put some carpet down behind it. The problem is it's way too dark and the focus is way off. So again, everybody being familiar with that type of rocker, it just doesn't stand out, I'm sure, the way they wanted to in this photo. A gentleman built a beautiful, beautiful coffin for a friend of his. And it wasn't just a simple pine box. It was a very beautiful coffin with lining on the inside and everything. And I'm sure it wasn't delivered until the time that this person passed away. The thing that totally wrecks the photo is the fact they didn't realize there's a box right in the background, you can read it clear as day, embalming fluid on the box. And so what should have been a tribute kind of photo, unless somebody really knows how to do a lot of Photoshop, just kind of diminishes the beauty of that photo. I'm going to assume that many of you that have a digital camera know the settings on your camera and how to use that camera. What I'm wanting to do is to show you in different categories, some low cost or no cost things that you can do using your phone that you can end up taking beautiful projects and turning those into nice photos that you're proud to share with other people. The areas I want to cover would be basic settings on your phone, tripods, lighting, different types of lighting that is, and then different methods of lighting, backdrops, and then just some little tips we have for angles and details. Settings. Now, I, I realize that different smartphones and different ages of smartphones have different settings. The first thing you want to do is go to settings. It looks like a little gear icon on most phones. And then you want to go to camera, go to formats, and you want to pick the highest efficiency format that you have, the best resolution that you can get. You can always go back later and change it if you need something of lesser quality for social media. But if you want to have the best photo that you can get from your phone, you have to use the best efficiency settings for it. Also, go to composition, and many of these phones have what's called a grid you can put on. And that's just a little guide that comes over your image. It's going to help you square it up a little bit so it's not running downhill or tilting backward and find the highest dynamic range that you can. And also, in that range, you have an option of not only taking the high dynamic image, but also what they would call a normal photo. So you'd have a choice of using both. That's going to give you the most options in being able to edit your photo, even on your phone, without any additional software, after you've taken that image. Tripods. Any professional photographer is going to tell you, even taking your own photos, the best thing you can do for yourself is to get a tripod of some kind. We're all getting a little bit older, and not to say that we're shaky by any means, but even myself, sometimes when you, when you want to get that perfect shot, uh, it could be wind. If you're shooting outside, it could be a number of things. You want to make sure that you have at least some type of tripod. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. I'll show you some examples. Some things that you have lying around the house, as simple as they sound. As you can see, this is, a, this is a toilet paper roll. All you have to do is cut some slots in it. It will work for like a small desktop if you're shooting smaller projects. 
If you need more height, you can step up to a paper towel roll. And if you really want one that's going to stand up off the floor, this is a, a roll from a gift wrap uh, roll that, again, same thing. You're just cutting slots into it to fit your phone. And they hold them pretty good, but you're able to take them out pretty easy as well. Again, another no cost, and you can vary the height on it depending on what you need, is plastic pop bottle. You're just trimming the top off. You're cutting slots in it. And the thing that I like is based on kind of the ribs that they have on the side, you can very quickly without even measuring, you can even those up across from each other as far as angle. The large ones got enough width to it that you don't have to worry about the stability on it. It holds it in there very well for you. But some of the smaller ones, you can use rice, you can use uh, sand, and the other thing that everybody has laying around their shop, you could use old mismatched hardware, screws, anything that you've got that I think everybody's got like a ball jar that has a collection of those things in it. You can use those for weight to give it a little more stability if you're unsure about it. Another thing that you can use in a pinch, and everybody's got a bunch of these, I'm sure, in their shop, you can use a clamp. What it's going to do, instead of you having to try to hold this and get the focus and everything else, it just gives you a little bit of a base that you can pivot off of, but it gives you that little bit extra stability. So all you're doing is having to touch with the one finger instead of trying to hold everything else. And it doesn't matter, you can use a little hobby clamps, any kind of clamp, as long as obviously you're just using enough pressure on your phone to hold it. My favorite though, that I invested in a couple years ago, and this was less than $20 off of Amazon, is this kind of funny looking tripod. And it adjusts in its height to hold your phone based on the model you have. It also pivots in different directions here with just this little thumb nut. And what's really cool about it is you can use it you know, for desktop shots, but if you need to extend that out to use it more like a, a tall tripod, these legs that are on here, it's kind of like a Gumby. They grip very securely on here, but easily. So then if you needed to, you can pivot that around and you can use a, a round dowel, you can use uh, like a one by one, it doesn't matter. It conforms to any shape that you've got handy. It also is nice not only for photography, but when you're FaceTiming with family or business associates, instead of having your camera going all around and kind of making them dizzy on the other side, it's so much easier to have your phone in a tripod and then it's nice and level and you don't have to keep adjusting it and everything. You just adjust it once and it's ready to go. But using a tripod is going to take that little bit of motion out, even for the person that is very steady. It's going to take that motion out, give you a much sharper focus. To mount it, it's very easy. As you can see, it just slides up. It's just that fast doesn't hurt your phone, it slides out very easy. The other neat thing is, if you really want to get into uh, sharp focus, a uh, photographer will tell you, even if you're using a tripod sometimes, just your hitting the button to take the photo sometimes can add a little bit of motion. This one also came with a very small little remote. And you just download some quick software, it's free, and so that way, you could have it even set over to one side if you want to get out of the frame and you can, have, you can have the remote actually take the photo on your phone. All that, less than $20. Next thing would be lighting. And again, you don't need to go out and spend a lot of money on lighting. I'll show you some examples that, depending on the size of the project and if you're shooting it on what we call a bench top or a larger, lighting condition. You might even identify some of these as being from Harbor Freight or some of the big box stores like Lowe's and Home Depot and Menards. They have little stands. Um, this one actually hangs. 
This one, again, has its own mount so that if you, if you had a dowel or even a piece of PVC pipe can make a good tripod as well. This wraps around it and just it grips onto the shape. Um, this is like a little puck light, which is, uh, actually runs off a magnet. Those are kind of the basic ones, the, what I call the low cost ones. What you might want to do also is because different lights put out different kind of color of light, you might want to get, if they're low cost, get a couple of them so that uh, you can use them together in tandem and you'll have the same light throughout your shot. Going up just a little bit higher in cost, and again, these are like from, from the uh, big box stores, if you want to call it, about less than $20. These put out just a little bit more light, and they're nice because you can pivot, you can pivot them. The thing I like about these versus the old halogen work lights is these don't heat up. They stay cool. So when you're using them, you still want to, you know, use caution, but um, you don't have to worry about as much, especially if you're going to have them on for a long time, that they're going to heat up like the old halogen lights with the cages in the front. Now some of the tool manufacturers have come out, I'm sure you've seen with work lights. This is one for Ry with Ryobi, and it runs off of a cord. It also runs off a battery you'd use in your Ryobi tools. The thing that I like about this light, now this is a little pricier, this is about $130 is what I saw that it retails for. But the, the nice part about it, and you start it just by pressing on the top, not only does it have a dimmer on it, but the thing that I like about it the most is you can control the color of the light. Now old shop lights that you're going to have in your ceiling, you might not see it when you're in the room, but your phone and any camera is going to pick up a yellow cast that's going to fall over everything. So it's going to change the color of your wood tones in your project. It's going to change the color of everything, as a matter of fact. This lets you play with the color of the light. So you can see here it's a very warm light, but just simply by turning the same knob that turns it on and off, I can go from a very warm, almost yellow light to a very cool, blue light. Just that easy. And again, that, di that dimmer on there is a very nice feature as well. Now, I don't know how much this retails for. I didn't have a chance to check. This is a work light from Rigid. And you can fold it open or close it. So it's actually giving you quite a number of options as far as directional light. It's got a little base, and again, it runs off of its own battery that works with all, you know, a variety of rigid tools. It also comes with, if you want to spend that much, it comes with a larger tripod, which goes up quite a number of feet. So that's different types of lighting from very low cost to spending a little bit more. But what's nice is these double as work lights in your shop. And I don't know too many people that would say that they've ever had more than enough lighting that they could ever need. It's kind of like with clamps as well. Um, again, if you're shooting, depending on what type of project you're shooting, I want to show you really quick uh, what we do for um, what we call bench top or small projects. Um, like jewelry boxes, maybe some turnings you've done. You've already got the clamps in your shop and your bench. And it's very easy to set up a little, uh, what we call a bench top sweep. This takes a matter of minutes. And all you need for that is a piece of what you call like counter, kitchen counter laminate. You can get it again at the, the big box stores. You raise it up.
clamp it in place. And you're ready to go. And the nice thing about this is you're not going to have a seam in there. Obviously, it's a curved surface, but it's flexible. And so that's going to make a lot cleaner background for you for those smaller projects. I don't actually have a finished small project, but as you can see here with this drill, in using this sweep, how not having a seam in it just makes a much nicer, cleaner image to work with. There's nothing in there uh, like a strange tangent or line coming in that's going to interfere with your looking at your project. Using the bench top sweep is great for smaller projects. For larger projects, you can go out and for about $12, 15 maximum, you can get a queen size white bed sheet that you can use as a backdrop. And again, what you want to have is where the bed sheet meets the floor, you want to kind of bring it out. So again, instead of having a hard line across the bottom of the floor, you want to kind of get a little curve in there, if you can, by pulling it forward and weighting it down with something in the front. Doesn't take a lot to do that. And also, if you don't know how to iron yourself, ask somebody that does know how to iron. Please make sure before you use it and when you reuse it, you'll want to have it laundered and have somebody just run an iron over it quick to take all those wrinkles out of it. Because even the best sweep, if you have too many lines going on in the background, distinct lines, again, it kind of defeats the purpose and takes away from the project emphasis. So we talked about lighting. I want to talk a little bit about how you need to light things with those lights. Always use indirect light. You never want to have light showing on it. That's where you're going to get glare marks and you're going to get uneven lighting by showing lights directly on the project. You want to actually bounce lights off of other things. Now our, our professional photographers bounce things off of ceilings, but we've got a ceiling that is equipped to be able to do that. If you're in your garage or in your home, um, obviously you're not going to be able to do that. But there is a way with using those smaller lights and just a little bit of added feature you can easily bounce light off of things. Now this is again very low cost. This is foam board and you can find foam board in any educational section in office supply stores, you can find it in Target. One sheet of this, which is 20 by 28 inches, is less than $3 a sheet. So I would encourage you not only to get single sheets, but also by taping up two sheets, you can get a nice angled piece that in bouncing light off of, you can control that angle. So you have something to play with. You don't have to hold it up while you're looking at adjusting your lighting and things. So you can do that at one time. What's nice is having another single sheet is that, and I'll show you this in a second, you can bounce light not only off of this sheet, but you can also bounce light off of this one, and you can adjust it then for as much uh, you know, lighting or shadow that you want to have or take away from it. You might also want to, and the same, the same price, you might want to get a black one. Now, that's the old uh, physics that we learned in school, is that white reflects light and black absorbs it. So you would use the black, if you want to tone down a little bit of lighting, you'd use the black instead of the white. But they're very simple to use, they're very light, and I mean, they store away pretty easy. So, let's, let's uh, envision that this is our project and I, particularly chose this darker drill to show you some of the lighting effects. And we'll um, put in one of these that is kind of a mid-range light and how you would use that. As we mentioned before, you never want to show direct light on your project. You want to bounce it. And that's where these white cards come in handy. And also having the light where you can direct the light so you can open or close 
and positioning between the two of them. You can get highlights on things that are still kind of soft. They're not, not harsh. You can really change the amount of shadow that you want on something. But again, everything is in clear lighting, showing all the details. I, I chose a, a black or a darker drill for this just to show you how you can get all this detail in here without overpowering everything with strong light. And it's just a matter of playing around with positions. Again, you can't make a mistake on this. It's what, what you prefer to see in that image and highlight in that image. And if you need to, as I, as I said, you can have another white card with another light if you need to bounce in some more from the other side. Um, you've got endless options. If you want to tone it down, you can use the black card. So very simple to work with. But you'll be so much happier with the quality of the images with just having that light bounced in there instead of this harsh light that's coming in directly on it. It's overpowering some of the shape. This lets you get everything in and you can literally control the amount of light a lot easier than just having some glaring light on the front of the project. So you can see also in using another white card and bouncing some of that light. Again, you're adding some subtlety in there and positioning positioning kind of both. It's going to help open some of those darker areas. And it's just a matter of playing with different angles. It's not, it's not hard to do. So that's basic. Again, low cost, no cost lighting. That makes a big difference. Last thing that I want to touch on are kind of what we call some of the details. If you've built a beautiful project and it's got uh, many times like beautiful figure in it, take a look around your project. Not to say that it's got one bad side versus another, but you might have a little bit of more of a dramatic figure on one side versus the other. And so you might want to take advantage of that when you're taking the final image, if you want to call it. Also, look at angles. Uh, many times what we do at Wood is we'll take something from a higher angle and we'll take something from a lower angle um, off from different sides instead of just shooting it straight on. We'll try to get one side and then the front together and also shoot details of little things. It might be hardware. It might be a variety of things that you want to have stand out. Maybe it's the dovetails in the drawers that you built. Those can be little sidebar photos to go with your main photo. The best thing is, is that all these photos you're taking are free. You can take an endless amount. Any professional photographer is going to tell you for every 20 shots they take, they might have one that they're really happy with. But you can get rid of them off your phone just that fast. If you don't quite like something, just delete it, move on. And with a, just a little bit of practice and patience and experimenting with things, you're finally going to get the photos that are going to match up to the quality of the project that you built.